Today, I'm going to talk to you guys about some work I did looking at the role of iron as a cofactor uh, for the ribosome in vivo and uh, what, that, what that means for the origin of life. So, okay. So, the ribosome is very ancient and very conserved, uh, so much uh, so, in fact, that it likely predates the last universal common ancestor and even cellular life itself. So, if we think about the origin of the, the ribosome, that really sort of puts it at around uh, four billion years ago here at, at the beginning of the Archean. Uh, and the ribosome evolved in an environment or on an Earth where the atmosphere was devoid of oxygen. And because of that, you had abundant, stable, soluble ferrous iron in, in, in the environments on the early Earth. And not only did the ribosome evolve in this environment, it was then encapsulated by cells and used in early, in early life forms for at least an additional one to two billion years uh, before oxygen started to rise during what's known as the Great Oxidation Event and precipitate out this iron. So thinking about why the iron content or the ferrous iron content of, of the environment would be important uh, for the origin of the ribosome is, is clear when we consider that divalent metal cations are absolutely essential to the structure and function of the ribosome and actually the whole translation system. Uh, and, and historically, uh, magnesium has really been implicated as the sole divalent cation in this process. However, we've recently shown that iron can actually uh, near totally replace magnesium uh, in, in the entire translation system and mediate the, the uh, translation of functional protein. So in these experiments, uh, and you can see that just on, in the lower line here, uh, with, with, with iron, we, we very much took the translation system in, and transported it to the environment of its ancestors uh, and were able to show that it, it retains function uh, in, in such an environment, in vitro, of course. Uh, and, 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 and after showing that in vitro, we, we then wanted to go in and see if, if there's anything going on in, in vivo with, with iron in the ribosome. And more specifically, are there environmental conditions or, gro or growth conditions under which a bacterial cell uh, where under, you know, sort of canonical normal laboratory conditions might have mostly magnesium associated with its ribosomes. Uh, can we impart conditions under which there are, there's, uh, it can sort of swap out either some or all of that magnesium in its ribosomes. And so to do that, we, we grew uh, E. coli cells under four different growth conditions. We grew them aerobically, uh, either in the, the uh, presence or absence of added ferrous iron, or anaerobically, again, in the, the presence or abs absence of added, added ferrous iron. And the thinking was it was really this culture that had uh, both uh, no oxygen, uh, and because of that, allowing for this ferrous iron, high amounts of ferrous iron to remain stable in solution, uh, what we're going to call our pre great oxidation event culture, pre GOE culture. Uh, ribosomes from those cells would, we thought, would have the most iron associated with them. So we grew. We grew the cells under those growth conditions, and then uh, in an anoxic chamber to keep everything nice and O2 free, uh, I, pure, I lysed the cells, purified out the ribosomes using a chromatography-based method, uh, concentrated the ribosomes using ultracentrifugation, and then was able to do some downstream analysis. And so we'll first look at the iron content analysis we, we measured using a total X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy. And so from that method, we, you just get an, an iron concentration in, in your sample. You know the ribosomal concentration of your sample. And, from that, we just calculate an iron per ribosome ratio, and that's what we're showing on the y-axis here. And on the x-axis, we have our, our four growth conditions, so our two aerobic conditions and then our two anaerobic conditions. And again, our pre-GOE anaerobic uh, one millimolar ferrous chloride condition. And what we can see is that, uh, indeed, in the pre-GOE conditions, we have significantly more iron associated with those ribosomes compared to the other four growth conditions, so about, about 10 versus about one uh, for the other three growth conditions. Uh, when we looked at the ribosomal RNAs of these, of these guys, uh, so uh, regardless of growth condition, uh, the 23S or the 16S, the ribosomal RNAs are intact, uh, and therefore uh, these ribosomes are also functional in, 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 in vitro translation assays, regardless of the iron content or growth condition. So then when we thought sort of more about the ribosomes and the way we were purifying them, uh, we realized something really interesting. Uh, it, if, if any of you purified ribosomes before are familiar with this field, really all canonical ribosome purification, you're just bathing these things in millimolar amounts of magnesium during the purification process and, and all of the buffers. And so what we we're thinking was, ha was happening is that, you know, there may be some iron pool that's associated in vivo that during the purification process is getting spontaneously exchanged for with magnesium from the buffers. And you're, we're, what, we're, what we might actually be seeing is magnesiums that are preferentially associated, at least in vitro, with magnesium. And, you know, 
thinking about if that's happening, well, we should be able to do the opposite. We should be able to purify this stuff uh, anoxically in buffers containing millimolar amounts of ferrous iron and swap in irons, uh, ending up with, with ribosomes that are preferentially uh, 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 enriched for iron. And that's what we did. And so that is the do these dots on the top of the graph here. And what you can see is that, you know, regardless, irregardless of growth condition, uh, these ribosomes are all able to soak up about 500 to 600 uh, irons per ribosome during the purification process from that buffer. And so that was really interesting and it tells us that there's a, a huge capacity, at least in vitro, for the ribosome to, to associate extensively with ferrous iron molecules. It also tells us something kind of really cool about, about th these data from the irons that are left over, left over, if you will, after purification with magnesium. These are, the, these are irons basically we couldn't wash out and sort of suggests at, at, at their, their sort of binding nature with the ribosome being either uh, tightly, very tightly associated with the ribosomal RNA and or, tightly, or deeply buried within the ribosomal structure. And uh, really thinking about the behavior of these, these irons and the fact that we're seeing around 10 sort of also possibly hints at, at the, the exact uh, mechanism of association with the ribosome. So Lauren Williams and his group have, have previously identified these, these interactions called dinuclear microclusters. Uh, these are interactions that happen in the ribosome RNA where you have two divalent cations that uh, are bridged by a common phosphate oxygen on the backbone of the ribosomal RNA. And so these divalent cations are very tightly associated and highly coordinated with, with, the pho with phosphates. They're also, most of them are, are, are very deeply buried within the ribosomal structure. Actually, many, many of them being very important for framing the, prep, the peptidyl transferase center. And then when you go to, you know, see how many of these things are in the ribosome, we find that there are four in the large subunit and one in the small subunit. And there should be two divalent cations in each of these dinuclear microclusters. And so we would expect around 10 uh, divalent cations to be participating in these sorts of interactions per ribosome. Uh, and, and, and in fact, we've actually recently got some, some support for this, uh, this hypothesis. Uh, a paper came out showing that these, at least in vitro, um, the RNA responsible um, for, for, the, for making these microclusters uh, it looks like it can fold in the presence of iron in vitro. And so right now we're sort of thinking about the, the next experiment or, or ex good experiments to do to, to, to really uh, uh, see, you know, a, 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 where this iron is and, and what it's binding to in the ribosome. Okay, so then we, we went back and we looked at the, the ribosomal RNA of both the ribosomes that were purified in magnesium and compared that to the, the ribosomal RNA of the ribosomes that were purified in iron. And so again, this is the gel I already showed you. So these, these are the intact ribosomal RNAs of the, of the ribosomes that were purified in buffers containing magnesium. And these are the ribosomal RNAs of the buffers uh, purified in the presence of iron. And what you can see here is that these RNAs really seem to be heavily, heavily degraded um, r right after getting them off the purification process, are already hev heavily degraded. Uh, and, you know, we really took a, a lot of great care to not, to not introduce too much oxygen during this purification process. So it's very unlikely that a significant amount of this cleavage is due to any, any sort of iron-mediated oxidative damage. Um, and so thinking about uh, other mechanisms of cleavage, uh, one, one of the ones we thought about was inline cleavage. And so this is a spontaneous uh, cleavage uh, mechanism of RNA molecules uh, where you basically get hydrolysis of the phosphate backbone. This, this, uh, uh, this cleavage mechanism is, is also accelerated by the association of divalent metal cations with the phosphate backbone of the RNA molecule. And actually, uh, uh, Becca Guth, uh, Guth Metzler, a, uh, another grad student in the Lauren Williams lab, and uh, has just really recently shown that iron can not only mediate inline cleavage, uh, suggesting that associates with the, the backbone of the RNA, but mediate at, at orders of magnitude higher rate than another divalent cation like magnesium. Uh, essentially, essentially, basically showing a, a new pathway of, of iron-mediated cleavage of, of rib, ribosomal RNA, which is an extremely exciting result in its own right. And actually, she gave a poster uh, last night, uh, but I think it's still up, so I, I urge any of you who haven't already seen it to, to go and uh, look at it. But basically, that's what we think is going on here. During the purification in the, in the anoxic chamber over, you know, a multiple-hour purification uh, in an anoxic chamber where it's difficult to keep things very cold, uh, we think the, the iron that is soaking into those ribosomes from the buffer is, is associating with the ribosomal RNA and therefore mediating uh, this inline cleavage. 
So like I just mentioned uh, in the earlier part of the talk, uh, growing uh, E. coli under these pre jewy conditions, these, these conditions conducive to the Archean Earth, uh, leads to elevated levels of iron within their ribosomes. And the fact that the, these cells retain this uh, is very suggestive of iron possibly being, you know, at, at least one, in, maybe possibly in tandem with magnesium and others, uh, uh, divalent cofactors for, for, for early translation, uh, and that these ribosomes are intact and functional. Uh, the in vivo iron we're seeing is, is, is because it can't be washed out, is, is, is likely bound to uh, RNA spots where it's very tightly associated and are deeply buried, like those dinuclear microclusters. And uh, also we're seeing iron associate in vitro extensively with the ribosomal RNA and, and mediate that in the cleavage. And so given those two points, that, that really suggests that possibly the iron that we're seeing you know, here is, is very much a muted signal and that purification under buffers of magnesium is, is, is washing out possibly significantly more in vivo associated iron. Um, and so thinking about you know, experiments to, to really get at the, the true number of, of irons associated uh, with the ribosome. Uh, and with that, I'd just like to thank uh, my advisor, Dr. Jen Glass, my co-advisor, uh, Dr. Laura Williams, uh, both members of both labs, and uh, NASA for funding all this. And uh, thank you guys for listening. We have time for exactly two questions. <laughs> okay, the ones who, anybody who has not asked a question before. Thank you for the nice paper. There's an interesting calculation that you might want to make. I'll just call this to your attention. And that is that we have a pretty good knowledge of how much iron ore there is in the Earth's crust. If you dissolve all of that back into the ocean, you only get about five micromolar iron in the seawater. And right now, of course, iron has rusted out and it's way down below, it's down the nanomolar range. So uh, just keep in mind that uh, iron might have been very dilute, much more than, much less than the millimolar concentrations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, that's always something that comes out thinking about sort of the actual in environmental relevance of iron versus other, other divalence. Um, definitely the, the environments on the early earth weren't totally homogeneous and there could have been environments where, where Iron and magnesium could have been possibly at competing uh, levels of concentration. Um, yeah, I didn't show this data, but even manganese looks to be able to, to, to mediate trend, uh, translation function. I, I, I think really it, it, the most true answer is probably it was some combination of, of those three and possibly even more divalence, um, especially at the early origins of the ribosome before you had other data, dedicated systems to go out and sequester and compartmentalize and concentrate. Uh, one divalent over another. But yeah, I think it's always important to very much keep the, the environmental relevance of, of all these things in mind. Thank you. Yeah, uh, two questions. You showed a plot of the, the GOE and the of higher availability of ferrous iron or before the GOE. What was the availability? Does magnesium availability change yeah, with so the GOE? That's one question. The other question is, have you looked at anaerobic iron-rich conditions today for bacteria that live there to see if they have two irons in these, dot, in these places? Yeah, so I'll, I'll cover the first question first, and that goes back to the previous answer. Um, it, 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 part of it is definitely sort of where you were on, on the Earth at the time. Magnesium was definitely lower um, due to the increased hydrothermal activity of the Earth, especially because hydrothermal activity actually sequesters uh, magnesium in, in, in crustal minerals. Um, so definitely more towards the ocean, and uh, the closer you got to any, any type of hydrothermal uh, uh, activity, actually, your ratio of iron to magnesium. Would, would increase drastically. But overall, magnesium was, was probably lower than it, significantly lower than it is today. Um, and then part of the second question is, yeah, that's sort of, that's sort of the logical, as I see the logical next step of all of this, but really the biggest barrier to that is just that nothing really grows that well. That's, a, that's an anaerobic, I'll look at anaerobe possibly to, to the, the ODs that you can get E. coli and just, just purify. So, so I definitely think it's possible, and I think it's an experiment that needs to be done because you can think about obligate anaerobes that possibly haven't seen oxygen for millions of years or possibly never in their, in their evolutionary history and, and postulate about, you know, not, not only uh, the, the biochemistry of, of iron versus magnesium in the translation system, but, but possibly they don't use magnesium for anything if, if, if they're in an, uh, an iron abundant environment and don't have to worry about oxygen. Uh, oxidative mediated toxicity, um, but I think there's a lot of method methodological challenges to that. That uh, finding that out. 
Yeah. I have around a billion questions to ask, but later, not now. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.